Recent uh, U.S. and allied NATO military buildup in Eastern Europe to the extent where there are simultaneously or practically so three major uh, war games occurring, uh, so-called Sabre Strike, which is occurring in the greater Baltic region, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Germany. Uh, the Baltics operation, BALTOPS, uh, an annual uh, military exercise of some uh, scope, uh, which includes a, a hundred warplanes and, and warships as well as a submarine, and a, uh, an exercise in the, uh, including in parts of Sweden called Arctic Challenge within the Arctic Circle, which includes 115 warplanes. So what we're seeing is not only the uh, permanent uh, shift or deployment of U.S. US and, and other NATO military hardware to uh, basically the entire western periphery of Russia, that is uh, Norway, the Baltic states, to a degree even Finland, uh, Poland, then across from the Black Sea and, and Bulgaria and Romania, we're seeing a massive buildup by the U.S. and, and, uh, and other NATO forces, uh, clearly and incontrovertibly aimed at Russia. As a matter of fact, statements have emanated recently uh, during the uh, Saber Strike War Games yesterday or the preceding day. Uh, a Polish uh, defense or military official, I'm not sure which now, uh, uh, issued a, a pretty provocative statement saying the uh, post-World uh, post War II period of peace is over. Uh, I don't know how else to construe that statement but to suggest we're now at war. That is, that Europe is at war again uh, for the first time since the end of the Second World War. Uh, uh, other statements have been made by NATO officials that the, the current buildup in Eastern Europe is the largest uh, since the end of the Cold War. And uh, these statements reflect reality. This is, in fact, what's going on. The U.S. has uh, managed, uh, through the mechanism of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, to establish permanent military installations, in many cases taking over air bases that could be used for strategic strikes against Russia. Uh, two in Poland, one in Lithuania, one in um, Estonia, and, and elsewhere. The U.S. has acquired at least nine military bases in Bulgaria and Romania, and the western part of the Black, or the eastern part of the Black Sea, including at least three major air bases. And this is what's been going on gradually since, uh, and incrementally since NATO expansion began in 1999, but it's been intensified with a vengeance in recent months to the point where the world truly ought to be alarmed, not just Europe, but the world ought to be alarmed. Because what we are talking about, as uh, the Russian President Putin mentioned yesterday at, a, at an event uh, when he signaled that Russia is going to develop 40 new inter, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, is that we, uh, we have a situation fraught with the potential of a direct military conflict between the world's two major nuclear powers. A uh, story you've acquainted me with uh, is that the U.S. is now trying to build up defenses against uh, potential cruise missile attacks uh, from Russia and perhaps other countries. Uh, so that we, we now see the kind of talk we haven't heard since uh, you know, the most dangerous uh, period of the Cold War, uh, even with missile threats and uh, nuclear missile threats between the world's two major nuclear powers. And this is all entirely attributable, in my opinion, and because I believe that Ukraine is simply the pretense and not the genuine cause. It is all uh, attributable to the fact that the U.S. has, uh, in the post-Cold War period, uh, used, expanded, uh, ultimately on a global scale, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization as the first instance in history of a global military alliance, one that we have to recall not only has expanded from 16 to 28 members in the post-Cold War period, but which now take in as many, it takes in as many as 50 military partners, so that we're talking collectively almost half the nations in the world are either full members of NATO or partners in, in various capacities. So that the threat posed by the post-Cold War um, revival and expansion of NATO cannot be overestimated. It has the potential, quite literally, uh, to lead this, uh, to lead our planet and its people to, uh, towards the worst catastrophe in history, which would be a nuclear war. Joining us now from Montreal via Skype is Michel Chisodovsky. He's with the Center for Research on Globalization. Many thanks for joining us here on Press TV, sir. Now, do you think it's the NATO Secretary General's place to warn Russia uh, against the situation in eastern Ukraine? Well, I think uh, NATO has the ability of turning realities upside down. Because recent reports confirm that it is not Russia 
uh, which is supporting the rebels, but NATO and the United States are supporting uh, Ukraine, not only with so-called non-lethal weapons, but also with military advisors, training, and so on, and that, in fact, uh, they are now providing core support not only to the armed forces, but also to the, the neo-Nazi, um, uh, you know, National Guard. And in fact, the U.S. Congress debated this issue, and they said, yes, we will support the National Guard, but we will not support the Azov Battalion. Other countries, such as Canada, are supporting the Azov Battalion. But I should say that, in effect, while the Azov Battalion has been recognized as a neo-Nazi entity, uh, the right sector uh, Nazi party uh, has uh, an oversight and control over, over the entire National Guard. And in recent developments, uh, the Ukraine military has been bombing civilian areas, including schools. There's ample documents to that effect. And ironically, NATO is accusing uh, the separatist forces of Donbass uh, of killing their own people, so to speak, when in fact uh, those, um, those strikes were perpetrated by Ukraine armed forces. Right. So, Dr. Chizodovsky, basically you're saying that the U.S. and NATO have set the grounds to ensure uh, that this grace period that there is of relative calm in eastern Ukraine is used to basically uh, once again increase hostilities and ensure that there is no separatist movement left within eastern Ukraine. However, my question to you is, what does NATO get out of it? Well, I think we have to look at the broader military agenda because uh, NATO, and when we say NATO, we are saying the United States. The United States and NATO are involved in war games on Russia's doorstep. Uh, they have several initiatives. They're moving military hardware to Eastern Europe. And uh, this serves as an act of provocation directed against the Russian Federation. And uh, they accuse Russia without evidence of uh, supporting the rebels uh, when, in fact, they have their own troops right on Russia's doorstep supporting the Ukrainian government, which is an illegitimate government. And I think there's another element which, is, which has not been understood or even uh, reported in the, in the media is that the president of Ukraine, President Poroshenko, has made the statement, and it's with the Ukraine Constitutional Court, that the, the coup directed against his predecessor Yanukovych was an illegal act and not a democratic transition. So that within Ukraine there is a leadership there's division within the leadership. The, co the country is in uh, an extreme crisis uh, following the imposition of the IMF, deadly macroeconomic reforms, and impoverishment of large sectors of the population. And within the armed forces, there are also divisions, and there's also a movement uh, at the grassroots to refuse to fight. In other words, not to join the armed forces, not to, uh, to be involved in a, in a civil war, uh, in eastern Ukraine. Right, so if Russia is the big enemy here, uh, what do you make of that, though? Is Russia a threat to the West militarily or strategically speaking? I think that uh, Moscow is not a threat. Uh, neither, is, um, neither is Beijing. And what the United States is engaged upon is a very dangerous path because they are... Uh, they have adopted the doctrine of preemptive war, uh, and uh, they are, in fact, also saying that they can use nuclear weapons against Russia uh, on a preemptive basis. Now, that type of discourse uh, is extremely dangerous because it could, in fact, ignite a World War Three scenario. When they say that, first of all, when they say that that nuclear weapons. The, the new generation of nuclear we weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, are harmless to civilians, 
uh, and can be used against non-nuclear states, um, and that they are also threatening Russia uh, with nuclear weapons. And this is very clear. It's, it's been debated in the, in the U.S. Congress. We are at a very dangerous crossroads in our history. Uh, the unthinkable, a possible World War III scenario. And this is no longer at the level of, of, of hypothesis. It has been envisaged by decision makers in the Pentagon, uh, and it could unleash World War III.